Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and uh, welcome to this October the 4th impromptu moment on the Silburn Show. I want to thank you so much for joining me tonight. And as you join in, just say hi. Where are you from? Today is uh, a Thursday, uh, t- not Thursday, Tuesday. And it's Black History Month. And uh, there's so much things in store, whether it's Black History Month or not. And uh, and every Tuesday, what I said I'm going to do is to have a uh, uh, different type of guest. My, my guest normally is involved in politics and uh, different things. But I said I'm going to go down. I'm going to go youthful. I'm going to go younger than myself. And therefore, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because deemed to be as elders now, we've got to be uh, persons who, who somewhat give a platform, if I would say, to the youths or the younger ones. Yeah. And that is something which is crucial. You know? So tonight I have Tis Tarni. Tis Tarni. And she's going to help me properly if I, if I say the name wrongly. Tistani, and uh, a conscious spoken word artist, rapper and trumpeter by night, teacher by day. She fuses grime and hip-hop with their soul-searching lyrical content. With her first single release, Coffee by the Sidewalk, you know, blending warm vibes and cool flow generously receiving over... 8K organic streams in the first month. Tisarne, Naomi Francis, has seven upcoming releases through MEPM, making them want to watch for 2022. One of the legendary flow poets headed by the flow sis of the world renowned Floetry. And she's going to break these things down for me further. Sanai, <laughs> Tisarne, I should have actually get the pronouncing right, as, as Shatton. Her pen over the years, gaining respect among their poetic pair big musical venues, and her limit her, her lyrics penetrate all different levels. And without further ado, I'm going to say welcome. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. The first thing you got to do is to help me to pronounce your name <laughs> properly. Yeah. So it's T Star Nay. Oh, oh, T Star Nay. Yeah. Second. Yeah, got it. Lost yeah. T. Yeah. No, we got it. We got it. T Star Nay. Well, listen, T-star I don't feel bad. I don't. I don't feel bad because Benjamin Zephaniah. I was watching him with on your on his show recently, mm-hmm. and he also I saw struggled slightly, so I don't feel that bad. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in pronounce it. Um, so anyway, how are you today? Um, yes, yeah, good. good mm-hmm. Can't complain. Uh, went to school, taught some good lessons. Um, got my marking cut out for me this evening. Um, that is that is the nature of the beast day to day. Yes. And the key thing is, conscious spoken word artist, um, teacher by day. And rapper and spoken word by night, and so I, I want to, I want, I, I want to thank you so much for coming on. And and I said, um, Naomi uh, Tistane is that I, I want to bring in uh, some young persons as well, who have a drive and a passion. And I'm not even changing the narrative; I'm just actually elevating the narrative, because sometimes when you say changing the narrative, it is as if to say the narrative wasn't out there before. It is what people focus on. Mm-hmm. And therefore, that's why I'm saying I'm elevating or highlighting the narrative of yourself. So if, if you can break it down for me and uh, letting people know, um, tell us more about, I, I, I sort of gave a bio, but tell us more about, about yourself, please. Um, so from a musical front, I am a spoken word artist uh, originally from South East London. Um, I grew up on grime music. That was the thing back when I was growing up. It was Channel U, it was rap, and um, just expressing yourself via um, in a creative outlet was the main thing. 
Um, so I've done that for years and over the years I've dipped in, dipped out. Um, I stumbled upon spoken word in the past, say, four years. And um, it was an outlet where a lot of creatives that had a lot to say came on a stage after work and just said it all and then went home. And I kept going back to these sessions and yeah. you kind of just get into a zone where you don't know anybody, but you hear their, their story for three minutes and you take away something new about them that you wouldn't normally come up or that you wouldn't normally state that in a conversation. So you kind of get a snapshot that they are as ordinary as you or they've got something secret that no one else knows mm. at work. And I was just drawn into the idea of um, putting words onto paper and having a purpose. Um, so I've done that for years and now going into schools that I teach in, um, I make it very clear that I do music outside of school so that so the students know that you can do um, or have um, a full-time job, um, have a couple of degrees and also find a way to still be creative outside the classroom. Yeah. And it's interesting what you mentioned about um, writing stories. You're talking about stories and things that you create. And this is based on what you see around you. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but also something else you said is about students or young people not losing the essence of their dream. Because normally sometimes parents, depending on the parents, they'll say, study a book to be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an engineer. But sometimes they've got a streak inside of them that needs mm -hmm. to come out. Mm -hmm. And therefore that streak is something which you, you well, that's, that's what you're picked upon, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's, in the classroom, you get to see a student from morning to night. You probably see that student more times than the parent sees their own kid. And ultimately your, you know, your job is yes to teach what you are specialized in, mm. but you want them to have an outlet that is going to be purposeful, positive. And if that's for either the power of words or them getting to write and express themselves creatively, then you build more than just a, a relation with them um, in an academic sense, but you ground them and you get to create who they are and you allow them to explore what kind of person they want to be. And then they take that craft in any direction and you just facilitate that growth. Well, I, I listened to your rap. I listened to one of your spoken word earlier, and I, you're gonna say it um, later. I've been well, but there's someone just said you're the best economics teacher out there. So, <laughs> oh, sorry, that's probably one of my favorite students, <laughs> Trevay, who you had on last week. And just to say, it's so great to see someone like Trevay that I've um, I've had the privilege of teaching in year um, ten and, ec um, and year eleven economics, and mm. he came to me with his business ideas. Um, during the lessons and after the lessons and he would sit down and tell me what do I think of this idea and what's great is after I left the school and Trevay moved to his own um, his own path he kept in contact and said he's applying for head boy and it took me back to when I applied to be head girl and was successful mm -hmm. in a school that had no black head girls before and he was in the same position where he was a applying to be the first black head boy and I think it's when you've got someone who you see so much of yourself in who's then going absolutely wild and absolutely smashing it as he's doing right now it's great to see his success is just starting yeah i i think that's i think that's very powerful and and i guess a lot of it has to be when, when i spoke to trevor anderson um a couple of weeks ago it was a lot of it was the influence that was around him the influence you can have bad influence you can have positive influence what were you what would you say are or were or is the influence around you that makes you what you are now even though you are still so much more to come for you <laughs> um so i know that you know from a household i've got a really supportive parents i know my dad's in the life somewhere and i know that he's he's big on me um you know putting my you know my craft out there and i know because i don't do my craft full time it's difficult when i'm in you know, a balance in a department and balance in my day job um, to balance my creativity. And I do uh, you know, really have a good support system around me uh, with my friends, my partner and my family that do put themselves in positions where, you know, if I've got a gig that's finishing late night, they are there. Um, if they do want, if, you know, if I do yeah. want to share some words with them, they do let me go over that same piece over and over again. And I think having people that buy into your story and they're, they're happy to see your growth and your journey through something that you're so passionate about has been um, has been great because a lot of people don't have that. And um, it's counting the friends that you've got around you and the family that support you to know that mm. people do want to give you a platform to speak and actually, you know, elevating you and supporting you rather than kind of crushing you um, is obviously the narrative. So 
I've been really pleased that if I can give that back in a classroom setting with students, then at least I can be that support system that they might not have at home. Yeah. I'm going to get into some of the music and your craft, but I want to delve into this bit about the influence. You mentioned about the supportive network that you have, your partner, your family, which I know. And, and Trey Ray also talks about that family network. You're in a school whereby you're meeting lots of different students. Mm -hmm. And you will maybe f meet a student one day who don't have that support network. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that child then? to support them along the way. Yes. So it's funny because these students come in many different ways and yes. it's either the ones that are uh, misbehaving in your class that are reaching out to say that something's going on at home and it may just have that extra conversation. A lot of them know that I am from Lewisham. I, you know, I've kind of, uh, kind of self-taught myself from the ground up and when the kids can see relevant in what you say and how you come across, then they get the buy-in factor. And so many students throughout my only short four years of teaching, I haven't been in teaching for so long, but the kind of people I've met, the students that I've helped from an academic perspective, or they just want someone to talk to, or they've had a hard day and they're getting it from all different teachers, uh, home life isn't great. It's just being able to instigate a conversation, um, give them the, the kind of space and the platform to talk. And hopefully you'll be able to piece the pieces together that allows the student in two years time or four years time to look back and know why those conversations took place. And, you know, there is no short win with students when in terms of their, you know, their output, you've got to be in it for the long run. And for these students that, you know, like a lot of the kids that I do teach, they don't know how to go about decision making in the right way all the time. And you have to allow that, that space to take place for them to work it out and then come back to you and ask for more help. And it's a to and fro. Uh, that, that's that's so very crucial because um, I, I believe that once I, I think I met a, a student from your school one time, I, I lost my phone and uh, couldn't find the phone. And then I called the phone mm -hmm. from another phone and um, the student had it and he, and, um, he, he, he found it and he said he's at the bus stop. And I went to pick up the phone from him and uh, won't say his, his personal situation, mm -hmm. but that was so very pleasing. And uh, I think, I think, I think a dad or what it was said that he went to your school as well. Yeah, I do remember him actually. And I remember telling him when I did see him, well done. And he didn't know what I was talking about at first. And when I said, then he said, oh, thanks, miss. And you can see he was chuffed at something that no one else knew he did that yes. day. Um, that someone else, and it's always that idea of who's watching someone else, you know, you are mm. representing the school, but sometimes I say, forget the school, that you're just representing yourself. People yes. judge you for your actions and the kindness, and even with the smallest uh, kind of contribution, someone notices that in a grand way, kind of like yes. you did in that scenario. Yeah, no, no that's very powerful. But anyway, let, let's, let's go into you now, um, because uh, I've seen, tell us more now about your journey now with the because you're not just spoken word, you're into rapping. You do rapping, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, we we can do a a, a, a rap off because you know, I'm, <laughs> I, I can rap for the people in the place. Many people tell me this, and it always ends up in a bad news story. So if you want to do that, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell tell us about your um your musical expo exploited. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yes, yeah, so as I um, stated, I I grew up on grime music. It was fast paced. It was energetic. It was powerful it was a narrative that was an underdog um kind of with a bit of high energy and you've got that grit and over time me exploring spoken word it's allowed me to put a lot of commentary about society from an economic background uh, from an educational background and put it into a story that is captivating it doesn't feel like a novel you're not being lectured to hopefully but you get something of an insight and Right. And for a lot of people, I found that the, the kind of conversation is that you say what I've been wanting to say or that you say things that no one else talks about. And that gives me the kind of leverage to keep on exploring and reading and writing in that, that way that allows people that particularly might not have a creative flair that they don't want to share on a stage, yes. but they feel like someone else speaks their language or someone else sees it from their perspective. And likewise, it just gives people that don't have an insight into your life it allows them to be humble for them to just dive in for three or five minutes to your life and understand something that they probably have never come across. 
and it's a two-way street you know it's I'm able to listen to so many stories on a stage because everyone around you's got something to talk about and for a lot of the artists they they just want to be heard they don't want to be listened to they want to be heard and you know for the people that go there they might not have that network at home or in school or work isn't the place they get to express themselves so they come down to open mic nights and spoken word is then what takes over people literally speak words that they've been pondering or they can't say at home or they just want to get off their chest and over time I've just worked on a craft that I know as a teacher it helps me with my addiction and I can articulate myself in a way that the kids relate to and they get what I mean and hopefully they take something away from the message in the classroom whatever I was teaching that day and in the same way when I go on stage that whatever the message was that I want to, to convey uh, the audience are able to just take that and dissect it and uh, kind of spin it on their own heads and see what they get out of it. So the target audience then, I mean, you're, you're young, uh, but what's the target audience of the persons that you, are, are you targeting an audience or you're just out there and then they gravitate towards you? Yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no target market. There's no kind of segmentation of age or anything. I mean, you know, I've gone from speaking at my own school to students that are in year eights up until, you know, grown 60, 70 year olds that are in the same room as coming just to hear artwork. That's what it is. There is no, words have no age. There is, you know, there is no discrimination with what a message is. So the people in the room that were meant to hear it that day are the ones that hear the message. Black History Month is here now. And, uh, mm -hmm. and this is a period now whereby there's this, this, this um, sort of um, movement. And, I, and I've spoken at Tears School already on, on, a, on a Black History Month once. I was invited there to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your, your craft and Black History Month, how do you see yourself uh, ch channeling the, the history? Mm -hmm. So I've moved to a school probably since you came down to my previous school. I've now moved to um, a school in Eltham. Uh, okay. okay. The school where um, Stephen Lawrence's killers went. So in a historic school where the school that I go to in Eltham is, you've got a legacy of racism, you've got a legacy of, um, of pre uh, police brutality, and you've got a, a legacy of um, a misrepresentation of uh, BAME students. And even in the classes I teach, I've probably got an average one to two black students across each classroom. It's predominantly a white school, a white working class school. Mm -hmm. So um, the staff body of us is probably 5% black. Um, rather in the previous school there, that you've gone, the head teacher, the vice principals, the assistant principals were all black. So yeah. I've kind of gone from a quite a strong BAME school to now there's not many BAME students. And it's interesting because they've got a, um, a working party for the student voice and they've asked me to contribute from a black um, kind of history perspective. And what I was pleased was in the room that I saw, it wasn't just black uh, girls and boys that were taking part. Um, it was white girls and boys. And ultimately I wanted them not to be doing the Steve, um, the Martin Luther King, you know, the, in the Harriet Tubman uh, kind of narrative. I wanted them to have current up to date modern versions of what black history looks like in 21st century That's because nice. if it is done in the way that we all know it then we're never learning about the new stories we're always revising or revisiting the stories that we kind of know and with all due respect they hold their legacy but we have moved on from so much and there's so many young black and yeah. bame uh, people in, or, um, of influence now in society that uh, hopefully this school will start to explore and when they see their own teachers that are involved in black history from BT sports to, to kind of in the classroom, they'll yeah. be able to think, well, this is a modern day of looking at black history. You're, you're very right. You're, you're very right when you mention about um, not dealing with the, the typical narrative of black history. Because if we keep talking about that type of black history, or which is black history still, we're forgetting mm -hmm. that two years ago, Black History was created. Five years ago, Black History was also created. Your dad is a part of Black History. We're all a part of, you are actually a part of Black History now to Trevé. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trevé Anderson, you're a part of Black History. He, he, he can stand up and say, my teacher is the best economics teacher. Is she old? Is she about 80? No, she's just in her 20s. Mm -hmm. That is actually Black History. So what you're saying is, is really right. And I, and I think that with, with, I always say for Black History Month myself, I always say that one should not just wait for the month to sort of 
talk about it. It should be a lived experience whereby we are, you know, we, we are learning about this every day. Our life represents black history. But at the same time, not that we are tied down with black history because we're also living in a society and we have to recognize that we don't have always, as some would say, chips on shoulders. Yeah. I know, I know I'm getting very controversial when I say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I agree. I completely agree. And I think when you are educating other people that maybe don't know your history as well as you do or you've got the same narrative, what then you end up doing is recycling the same information, which is great for people to mm. know if they don't know, but actually what they should be knowing is what's happening around them. Like you said, it's, it's knowing what modern day history looks like and understanding that it's modern day future pioneers that mm. are making history today for tomorrow. Uh, rather than we think, you know, we need to go back to, you know, to Harriet Tubman and we're looking at, uh, I mean, like anyone that's got a, um, a historic legacy rather than a present day purpose. Yeah. Well, actually, your father now, we found out that there was, there was another lady other than Rosa Parks who mm -hmm. actually sat on a bus before. Yes, but, my dad did, did tell me, yes. But, but we found out that she didn't, <clears throat> fit the, she didn't fit the narrative because she was, mm. she was a bit brown. Mm -hmm. She was maybe deemed to be superficially black, so they mm -hmm. so the black <laughs> they cut her out of the history Wasn't there. Quite black enough, yeah. You know, so 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 that goes over. But listen, um, so we, 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 at the end of the show, you, you're gonna do a, a piece, a, a Black History Month piece. Well, not a Black History Month piece, but something which is very inspirational about what you. But what's your definition of? I, I like to always ask this question. Mm -hmm. um, what's your definition of success? Um. It's when your talent doesn't pay off and your hard work prevails. I think everybody has a talent and um, however you go about um, opening that talent or exploring that will become at different phases and at different stages. But if you've got a, um, a, um, a kind of a tenacity to work hard, then that will work as hard when your talent hasn't worked as hard. Um, mm. So it's always looking at hard work prevails and talent is an add-on. And if you can marry the two together, then then you are more successful and probably blessed than, you know, than, than a lot of people. So that so, is it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I guess what you're actually saying is that having the gifts of the gap is all great. And but the most important thing is persistency and consistency mm -hmm. right through and hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being kind to yourself as well. I think it's difficult when we measure success on a metric as well, how much have I achieved? And I can be guilty of that, um, you know, turning 30 in February, how much can I do between, um, between now and then? And <clears throat> not looking at the small wins and potentially looking at the, you know, the input you've had and the consistency that people know what you do, if, even if they don't see it on the outside. If you haven't put an, an, an anything new on the output, you are still working hard on what you truly believe is a purpose or you're working hard on be, you know, becoming progressive in one way, form or another. Do you feel like there's a weight of history upon you in the sense of a uh, uh, role model, as a role model? Uh, where, you know, sometimes persons find themselves and mm -hmm. surprised that people look up to them as a role model. Do you see yourself as a role model with a responsibility? Um, to, I think it's my dad that's probably told me over the years that I am a role model to a lot of the students I teach, especially when I was teaching in Lewisham, um, growing up in Catford myself. That's all I've known is Catford and Lewisham. I've gone to a, um, a state school in Lewisham. And then me being in the classroom with younger black boys and girls looking up at a black teacher um, in a classroom, teaching subjects that you don't really get that many black faces in. French was my first degree. And then economics and business is now what I, you know, teach and lead on a department. And when students see you in spaces that aren't normally taken up by you, I guess you realise that you have come a long way and you do want to make sure that you are relevant in spaces that perhaps are unknown to, uh, to others. Because, you know, if there's no space being taken up by you, then someone else has taken up your space. So within that, I, I can admit now that I, um, I do have a responsibility to uh to kind of keep pushing the younger generation forward or the ones that i come in contact with anyway mm. and how, how do you and do you push yourself hard uh i'm like my dad so <laughs> so so yeah i guess i guess um i do like to, to kind of keep a goal in mind or i do like to um have a next project in mind yeah. um and you know like it fits into the narrative that i like to be 
on an economic front. I like to be a social commentator. I like to put that into a creative outlet like spoken word. And I'll just keep on pushing the dialogue to different places, different spaces and getting more people just to be involved and understanding that from my angle and also from other people's perspective. So if you see injustice, your, your words will, will speak into injustice as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, yeah. You did something on Floyd. On, on, on Floyd recently as um, well. Yeah, a couple of years ago, I did write a piece um, mm. that you can find on my socials um, and you can find on Spotify called No Justice, No Peace. Yes. And it was a tribute to, at the time when we had the riots and we had the, yeah, the protests, uh, we were looking at the police brutality and understanding that uh, we need to to kind of you know take on and take over the the kind of spaces that we should be uh, operating in and, you know, making our voice, uh, you know, kind of being being spoken um, on behalf of, but also able to uh, to captivate an audience that says, well, we, you know, that we know what we know, we don't need to be spoken by by other races. And I think that was the key narrative there, was that we were done with hearing about ourselves in a negative light, when actually a lot of people, um, a lot of the black community are progressive and are positive, but you don't hear that narrative as much. So you're fearless? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. radical. You, uh, um, I'm nonchalant. I'm I, I, like I'm very self-assured, perhaps. So yeah, so, fearless is probably. I'm, so, so you, you see, I haven't thought of that yet. Okay, so you see the injustice, and you go in there and you address it. Address it in a crap. yeah, more less on the protesting side, but more on the academic front. Yes, yes, yeah. and, and and that's and that's the beauty about life. Sometimes we we all different. We 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 don't have to. As they say in Jamaica, chant down Babylon one more time. We don't have to mm -hmm. be on the street there, but we can do it in different ways uh, as well. What, what would you say then, um, not for Black History Month, but to, to the youths now, for young persons um, who are out there and need that challenge or in despair or they, 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 they are classified within that narrative at times, the narrative yeah. which we try to push against. What is your message then to young people especially young black boys young black girls you know what i mean um i think it's the idea of um your like i'm i'm such a firm believer that your future self will thank you for your today's actions and as we grow wiser we go through new experiences our network changes our our peers around us start to drop off or you start to add on you realize that you can't go back and rewrite what you've done you can only move with the tools that you've got and if you're sharpening your tools as you go along in the long run, they're going to serve you a good purpose. And it's difficult mm. for young people to see that, that, um, that goal uh, when there's so much distraction, there is so much happening. Um, and I think you've got to be able to say, even if you're making mistakes now, which we all do, the idea is that you learn from and you're always looking to not make them as a, as a choice, as a habit. And if you're looking at making your future self proud, then look at your, you know, your today's uh, options and think, well, is this going to benefit me or serve me in the long run? And I think a lot of people don't want to um, value or add up the long run versus the short run. Yeah. I think that's very difficult when you're young to try and think, well, what is the long run? What is my next steps? I, I think the advantage you have is the support network you have, but also to be able to aware of certain things at such an early age. Because when you say I speak to your future self, many people always say, if you could speak to your younger self, what would you say? But you're actually speaking, you're speaking into your future self, which is really powerful. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm glad that the new generation is actually very perceptive. Mm -hmm. and, and ladies and gentlemen, if you want to actually follow um, T.S. Sarney, you can follow on Instagram, Spotify, Apple and music. You can see I've, I've pinned it there as well. I, 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 want, to, I want to ask you to, to do a, a piece and, mm -hmm. and I've learned today that this is what you do. <laughs> yes, yes, you do click when you like a lyric. You do click yes. as, a, as a form of appreciation. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, what I would like you to do is put a number one, a one, you know, because since you can't flick. Yeah, I want, so I want if you, you flick. like the lyric. If you don't if you like, like the lyric, then you can keep your hands closed. I won't be okay. okay. <laughs> How does that go? How does that go? What is so that? if you don't like the lyric or you don't find it particularly uh, exciting, then you can just, you know, just... Just keep your hands closed and just appreciate it from a nod. But if you're okay. really feeling the lyric, then that's when you click. Okay, so, so break it down for me. So when you're in the, the spoken word um, arena there, yeah. what, what is, what, 
break it down. What is the appreciation and what is the non-appreciation so, and what is the value? So it depends on the levels of, of the kind of night. So some will be bouncing on tables, drumming on tables. If they like a lyric, it's a form of expression to say yes. Some even shout out to, you know, to pull it up and that means you do the whole thing again. That can be quite an off throw thing to do. Normally, it's just a click as a way to say, yeah, I resonate. I get that. Okay, cool, cool. So what are you going to do for us tonight? So um, in nature of uh, the BT Sports um, uh, program that I've been uh, lucky to be part of uh, this October, which was uh, looking at black uh, sports people uh, in um, history. And this piece was dedicated to Althea Gibson, who was a, um, a tennis player that paved the way before Serena and um, Venus Williams and Corey Goff that nobody ever knows. So kind of going back to what we spoke about earlier, that um, it's about the narratives of people that probably didn't get a voice. So this is um, a tribute to her, um, her work. Wow. So how many times in life can you say that you were the first to do something? How many times in life can you go down in history and rewrite her story and say you really did something? See, being the first black tennis player that opened the world to a world-class player that simply left the crowd confused with the talent she pursued as she was profusely profound, growing up, resided and found in New York City, grabbing titles before and after her name, bagging degrees from Florida City. And I haven't even got down to the real nitty gritty, silly Billy. So I say it louder for those at the back. How many times in life can you say that you were welcomed down at Wimbledon and happened to be black? Entering the grass courts from a lean, powerful serve that many few could return it back. Success swinging titles, winning black to black. I mean, back to back. I spit facts. Let me not retract on stats. I mean, we're here to celebrate black on black achievement from the high achievers. Althea Gibson then took up golf in 1964 and became a professional in two sports. Can you really believe it? Multiple wins from a single female. Well, I must be seeing double because she was million mixed doubles as she dabbled with her billings, switched them dollars then from shillings. She left a competition for dead. Yeah, she really made a killing. Gibson, paved the way for many that many have forgot. Sure, we can mention the Williams sisters or even now Corey Goff. And although they have paid their name and mastered their name, we cannot forget the OGs that paid the way. Gibson. Serving for match point, pointed out the sheer discrimination that we don't even hear of today. Winning Wimbledon in 1958, she was entering the grand courts through the black doors. I mean, the back doors that, of course, highlighted the lack of remorse that a game like tennis, full of unity and good sport, still found a way to leave the black players. Sure. And recently, the Williams sisters paid homage to the great. They tweeted that them and Gibson have shared holding that same Wimbledon plate. How many peeps these days say they want to grow up and be somebody? Well, Gibson had been there, did that, wrote that autobiography titled I Was Want to Be Somebody in 1958. Read that. See, we're here to celebrate black on black achievement from the high achievers. Althea Gibson. Remember that name this month. Now I've told you that description. And Thanks. ladies and gentlemen, and that's what we do. Thank you so much for that. I, I must say that uh, when I listened to it earlier, yeah, Thank the you. name didn't click onto me properly. Mm -hmm. it, it it went over my head. I actually was thinking about the Williams sisters, mm -hmm. and it is now you have actually educated me <laughs> mm -hmm. about that's this person. Job. Was, Job's done, you know. And and that and that's a powerful thing. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, what this is actually saying is that black history is not just for the youths or for those who are much younger than us. We are learning each day because I'm at, that actually just resonated because as I said, I listened to it earlier, I was preparing for you, but didn't really pick up until what you just said there now. Listen, um, this was really great and it, it was really powerful. I can see some ones there, junior goat and uh, different persons. And I look forward to hearing more about you and your ventures out there and the way that you are supporting and uh, motivating young people. Uh, uh, you say you rap, do you? I do rap, yeah. Yeah, I can rap, you know, let's, let's do a rap for the people in the, do you do, <laughs> do, do, you do beatbox? I can't beatbox, that is a tough okay, I do, I do the beatbox. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go do like that. <laughs> I, I do the beatbox and you do the rap. That's if you want. <laughs> okay, I can hear the beat going, okay. 
Look, see, my rhymes go a long way. Never been subbed in a game. It's a long way. Not greedy. Got my eyes on my own plate. Parts of us in the four low because I just ate. <laughs> what a people in the place to be. I got Miss Francis to sound and listen to me. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so born. That is my click to you. Listen, listen I, got, I got clicks. I got clicks. Listen, listen. Thank you so much for tonight. And it, it was you. awesome. Thank you for having me on. Yes. And, and, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I, I'll get this up on YouTube as well for other persons to look at it as well. And, uh, you know, keep the work that you're doing and, and, and God bless you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Okay. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. See you. All Take right. care. And ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Bye-bye.